Hey, everybody, and thank you for joining us. As always, another episode of Your Day with David. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to the channel so you know exactly when we're dropping these. And obviously, that way, if you or anyone you know feels like they need to tune in and, and share some time with me and my friends, you're always more than welcome. Today, I have Ish here on the show. And if you guys remember episode five with Emily, we had talked a little bit about him, but Ish is Emily's boyfriend. Um, and Ish was a, a voice that I was fortunate enough to lean on uh, earlier uh, and or more like the later ends of last year, kind of just talking about some of the stuff that I go through, some of the stuff that I've experienced growing up. And then, you know, in that vulnerability, he also shared with me some of his experiences uh, growing up as well. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here today is um, growing up in what I'll call maybe the system, right? When you get, get bounced around a little bit um, and, and I'll kind of let you go more of a deeper dive into that. But firstly, you know, do you want to give a little background, you know, what are you currently doing now? And I guess, you know, what is the, the end goal that you're trying to reach, right? Yeah. So, hey guys, I'm Ish. Um, currently, I am a grad student in clinical psychology. I'm doing my master's and I hope to get my um, licensure after graduation with a MFT route or LPCC route. Um, and yeah, and I you, mean, you know. And what, what do those stand for? for the... Yeah. So um, basically one is a marriage and family therapist and the other mm -hmm. one is a licensed professional clinical counselor. So these degrees um, are actually not psychologists, they're counselors. So um, basically a, count, a psychologist, which is what I plan to do actually like later in the future, which would be a doctorate. So either PhD or PsyD, doctor of psychology. Um, those uh, involve a lot more like clinical work. So, you know, the spectrum of different, uh, more serious mental health issues, like, you know, bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, like anything on that spectrum. And, mm. you know, a counselor does more, I would say, kind of um, a lot more of like everyday issues, certain things impacting you. Um, also, you know, maybe like relationship stuff, but it doesn't really have that like deeper dive into it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, currently um, I'm just in this master's program. And um, after two years or so, I will graduate. But um, most programs, in, like in order for you to get licensed, you actually have to do 3,000 hours of work, mm. um, which is basically like full time two years, uh, like work. Yeah. Um, and only after do you take your exams to be able to get licensed. And then after that, you can like maybe open up a private practice, do something like that. And I think my plan is that after after that, somewhere along in the future, I would actually want to pursue the doctorate. So that's like mm. an additional, you know, like maybe four years of school or something. But yeah. Four years left from here? No, no, no. This is like four years in the future. So like right okay. now I have like four years until I get fully licensed. Okay. And then after that, I can maybe choose to take some time to work. Mm -hmm. And then maybe if I am still feeling it by the time, you know, I'm 24 right now. So this might be like when I'm 30 and yeah. then maybe I can like go this ID route. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, could you explain for those listening as well? Cause there is a stark difference, you know, what's the, the differences between say a psychologist and then a, a psychiatrist, right? Right. So um, a psychiatrist is a doctor who pretty much like prescribes medication they don't necessarily mm -hmm. um, provide you with psychotherapy, whereas um, a psychologist can do the same amount of kind of psychological testing and evaluation to really diagnose someone with a specific disorder, but they don't necessarily like provide you with any like medication. They would like refer you to a psychiatrist mm. and a psychologist has extensive training um, in basically like psychotherapy. So they do sessions with you, all the different types of therapy, you know, they might have a certain background, which they focus in because there's many different types of therapy angles. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, uh, another thing is that, you know, there's a difference in the psychologist between like a PhD and a PsyD. So a PhD is very also heavy research based. They have a lot more training in their program 
in order for like for research as opposed to like clinical training which is what a side e is hmm. um so they might you know actually you know teach classes they could do their own conduct their own research and then also do psychotherapy on the side yeah okay nice and i guess then you know when we think about psychotherapy and one of the one of the probably the for me has been a very important kind of subcategory of psychotherapy is cbt cognitive behavior behavioral therapy mm -hmm. right where that's probably something where more uh a psychologist works with then I say psychiatrist, is that right? Just teaching you different ways that you can kind of frame your environment and then also reacting uh, in a healthy way to certain triggers, if you will, or more sometimes kind of just identifying those triggers, figuring out uh, why you're acting this way, controlling that reaction. Uh, I, I think uh, if there's anything that I would instill upon the people listening that kind of go through uh, say episodes, if you will, with their mental health, a lot of times it comes down to identifying what it is that is actually the issue at hand, right? Not so much the feeling that comes with it, because the feeling is just a reaction, right? It's more, okay, why am I reacting? And then once you kind of identify it, uh, the unknown's gone. And when the unknown's gone, it's really, well, I shouldn't say easy, but it's a lot easier uh, to then kind of frame your reference around that. That's what I've had to do. Um, a lot of times and uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, a lot of the times it comes down to just breathing, right? I feel like a lot of people forget to breathe. Um, yeah. And a lot of a lot of emotional control comes from breathing, actually, and I won't get too into the depths of, of things like meditation, mainly because I don't know the science behind it. And I, I hate to share things uh, that I'm not educated enough on to talk about, but sometimes all it takes is sitting down uh, and a lot of people think as well, meditation, you have to like cross your legs and all this other stuff, but really you just need to be in a comfortable position and, and just breathing in, breathing out. And a lot of times too, people think, okay, well, meditation also means to take all your thoughts and just push them away, right? Just be, be out of, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing, but it's not true. What it means is to sit with those feelings, to sit with those thoughts, right? And then be at peace with them is... I think a, a healthier way to, to look at it, um, you know, train yourself to be with those thoughts so that the next time they come around, they're not nearly as powerful for you. Um, I'm not sure when, when you're in schooling now in your master's program, I, I had seen something on social media. That's why I want to ask this up. Do they, or maybe could you tell me how has schooling changed even in just maybe the short time that you've been um, in the environment, when we start talking about things like social media, the impact that it's had on people and their mental health, and also how they interact with their own social environment too. Because I'm sure with the explosiveness of how technology has advanced over the last even decade, right? That teaching has to have had to adapt as well to help people that kind of suffer through that exposure. Yeah. Does that I make mean, sense? Yeah. I, I would say, you know, since starting school, I've thought an ex like I've thought an ex like a lot about social media and the impact that it's had on um, just people, you know, growing up and um, actually like, you know, I wrote some creative story about like kind of the impact of, social media and stuff which I won't really share but the gist of it is just that you know hmm. um we live in a world of uh social comparison from like a very you know young age we're getting these messages that you know um we are con we are like just sharing our life in front with other people on this like public platform and you know depending on you know how you're raised what messages you're getting from your family from your environment from your friends etc a lot of people can like you know um internalize a lot of those messages and feel kind of through this process of kind of social comparison that you know i'm not good enough there's something mm -hmm. like wrong with me debating depending on like you know um certain likes or you know all these kinds of things how they look etc so i think i mean we've definitely like been 
given material, that's not directly telling us the impact of like what social media is kind of like having on just human relations and, you know, the process within self and how that develops. But it's more like through the material that we're given, we get to think about these things in our own time. And this is just kind of like things that I've kind of thought about based on my own experiences. Hmm. The, the reason why I had brought that up, I had seen somebody post, uh, it was like one of those, you know, unpopular opinion posts. Um, it's basically saying that, you know, people growing up in elementary and middle school um, should not be exposed to social media. You know, they're not ready for social media. That was the unpopular opinion. And I could see why uh, there is sentiment to that. Right. Because I think about full fledged adults, right? If that's what you want to call us. Um, and how we base, like you said, our life on social comparison, how we are doing relative to our peers, whether it's success in our career, it's success in our relationship, it's success relationships success in you know our social environments whatever that might be um and it's crippling you know for a lot of people and then you you know people who put on the facade that yes we are in you know a perfect relationship when behind doors there's there's so much going on and so much going wrong um or yeah everything you know anytime you ask someone how how work is going you know works fine, you know, making, uh, uh, getting that paycheck, you know, checking off all the boxes when really they're dissatisfied with work and, but they can't let other people in their social, you know, environment know that they're struggling. Right. Yeah. And you think about just how, you know, mentally taxing that is on, on us as, as people, as adults, let alone, immersing people at a much younger age into that type of environment because it sets a precedence right that social comparison is the norm um and so yeah, i saw this thing you know eighth graders don't look like what eighth graders used to look like back when i was in eighth grade right they yeah, yeah. they success they successfully skipped the awkward phase uh <laughs> where uh and maybe it's just because you know nowadays People are like, okay, you know, makeup's much more common or stuff like that at a younger age or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, I just, I don't know. It, it's more interesting for me to see. I don't know if you have an opinion on kind of the exposure that people have at a younger age. I don't have a, a yes or no. I, I like to look at it from both sides. One, because I'm, I mean, technology in general, obviously hard to say that it, is not a benefit to everyone's life. It's social media as well. I mean, it's a the only way, the best way to connect with people near and far. It's unfortunately just also means to, like you said, compare ourselves to those around us. And a lot of times people think that we're on the same timeline, right? At, you know, you at 24, me at 26, um, you know, at a lot of people back in the day, say like, you know, my father's day would have had a home already. We would have had two kids. We would have started our career of 40 plus years in the same job, you know, with the same loyalty to that company. Uh, but it's just not the case anymore. Um, and I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. If you did want to sh kind of touch on anything else there on that topic. Um, yeah, I mean, to answer, I, I would say just like, just wrapping up, I guess, like the social media bit, I kind of feel that, um, you know, there's like this, this feeling that, you know, I wouldn't really have like an answer whether or not, you know, I think people should be exposed to like that young age or not or anything, but all I can share is kind of just like my thoughts on the matter. And I think mm -hmm. that the biggest thing, though, is that as, like you said, fully fledged adults or adults that 
we can probably understand more this concept that like you know when you see things on social media these things are very curated these are like very picked moments and ultimately they really show the outcome they never show the process of getting there and that mm-hmm. process like you're alluding to can be very strenuous or i mean we don't know what's going on in the background of other people's lives but we see the outcome and most often that outcome is like something great so mm-hmm. you know we get hooked on just comparing to the outcome whereas we're not really ever seeing or being cognizant of the process now at a young age i think understanding what i just said like you know if you're in your elementary school middle school you know this this concept of like you know things being curated and we're not showing the process and you know someone could probably get it but most often like we're really just going to be fully comparing ourselves to the outcome all the time and we can't even be conscious of like um the process so all i remember is that you know from a young age i mean i remember you know like before instagram or anything like that on facebook i would see like a lot of my friends growing up who were like popular or whatever you know getting like a lot of likes on their pictures or whatever and i always like compared myself to them so i think a lot of people you know can fall into this trap and that can cause so much like um just internal damage at such a young age so yeah it's it is an important topic but yeah yeah cool well you know could you, you know it's interesting as well now that you are in schooling to become a counselor and this is kind of what i want to uh, touch on too was you know how did ish get there right because yeah you know, now you're in a position, ideally, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you're going to be able to try and help people in, you know, a much more influential way in their lives than a lot of people can. Uh, But the question is, why? Right? What led you to there? So I'll kind of let you share your background, maybe even, you know, we can go as far as, you know, growing up. And then, you know, I'll chime in a little bit here, here and then, but just want to hear a little bit more about your story. Yeah, um, So yeah, I mean, it's a very lengthy, I guess, story, but I guess I'll kind of talk about like the main events, I guess, you know, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I grew up with uh, two very kind of like highly educated doctor parents from India who, Mm -hmm. you know, in their, in their youth, they were, um, you know, the top students in the, in like the country Mm -hmm. and stuff. Both my parents were, you know, in kind of like the Harvards and stuff of like India and their medical school and their program. You know, my mom was like chief resident on her exam. She was like number one in the state of Haryana. Like, so I came, I came from like a very um, just academic, like academically inclined family. Mm -hmm. And when they um, immigrated here, the to the u.s you know to try to create just a better life for their kids as many parents immigrant parents do um they just i guess they kind of saw a lot of the like harsh realities of the of this world as soon as they came just as you know a lot of people do you know they can't they come here with like no money and they like really struggle in the beginning Mm -hmm. and you know my upbringing was my parents having a lot of just very high expectations as many you know asian parents do um in terms of uh, academics um but see the thing is is that um i actually have adhd and Mm -hmm. but i wasn't diagnosed until i was in college so for me academics and focus and exams reading all these things they didn't come naturally and i always struggled because you know i had this problem and i was never really like medicated Um, so my grades are bad and, you know, that caused like a lot of kind of conflict at home because, you know, my parents are having these like expectations for me to like, for greatness, you know, they want me to be a doctor. They want me to like, um, to just flourish and thrive and stuff. And I think when you mix that with like all of these, you know, cross-cultural like issues of like, you know, growing up as, you know, an Indian kid in a in a in like a westernized society and this kind of like 
mismatch of hey like what are the cultural norms like indian culture is very collectivistic you know westernized culture is very individualistic and it kind of was a lot of this you know i'm learning something from my parents in the household but then i'm going to school and i'm learning something completely different and at school it's kind of like you know the space for exploration to really kind of know myself to make friends and i feel like you know that resonated a lot more with me so I think when I started adopting more of these like individualistic westernized kind of um, mentalities and brought those home, it just didn't really like sit too well with my parents. We had a lot of um, just Fr- mismatch expectations, friction. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it was hard. It was hard. And we just had like a lot of disconnect. And I think over the years, we just like slowly started to like fade and our relationship got like very strained. And I think, you know, this manifested a lot in the sense of, you know, I have my own kind of traumas from my childhood where, you know, um, my parents not really knowing any better would um, just, it was like a kind of like a toxic home environment. And there was like a lot of like emotional, just like, like abuse and other things like that. So, I mean, it was difficult. Um, and I think as I grew older, it started manifesting more in middle school. And, you know, I developed some kind of anxiety kind of related symptoms. Um, but when I went into high school, they became full blown and I developed like panic disorder when I was 15. Um, so this is kind of like my, this is the start of like my journey kind of like with therapy. Like I never knew what therapy was. This is kind of like the first time I um, tried something and I kind of didn't like it you know I didn't like talking about my feelings I didn't like talking about my family you know I, I just couldn't talk about anything emotional or my pain or my suffering or my disconnect from my parents because you know I was just kind of living a life where I internalized all these messages that it's just not okay to be Ish like Ish is just bad there's a lot of shame, you know, there was uh, a lot of this thought that like, you know, if all these things are happening to me, I must be bad. Like, I must be not worthy. I must be useless. You know, these are a lot of the thought Mm. processes of someone who's kind of like in the, in the early stages or in like having like, you know, depression. And, you know, I think in the next year or two, this like really started to like, churn inside you know my my brain and you know by the time I was uh 17 that's when I first uh started getting severely depressed and um you know I won't go into like too much of the details as to like like what caused certain things or like the triggers and stuff but um eventually I did become uh, suicidal and I just I feel like I just couldn't like connect to anyone in the world. And it became mm-hmm. very difficult because, you know, I just became very isolated. I think mm-hmm. initially there was a lot of um, other people, you know, in- not maybe not intentionally, but they were doing things that, ma- that caused me to be isolated. But eventually, you know, as many people kind of, progress through their stages of trauma or whatever you know they became they become their own enemy it's not so Mm. much that you know those external factors are causing them so much distress it's like in the end you internalize it and when there's a lot of shame involved then you become your own bully you know you become that your own abuser in the sense of um you kind of perpetuate your you like facilitate the the negative self-talk where it's just like i'm bad you know i don't deserve to live i'm worthless etc and you know the thought you, loops and, yeah and thought becomes loop. a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy i guess yeah as well so you know after i was hospitalized for the first time i would say like that's when my life changed not for the sense of in for the better it actually got a lot worse before it got better 
but Mm -hmm. that that was like the turning point because i remember when i was in like a hospital for the first time i felt comfortable Mm. i felt like other people understood me i felt like there was this sense of you know like holy shit there's like other people out there who are like you know not feeling so hot you know they're in the same situation they you know for whatever reason they're there it's like we're the common thing is that like everyone there has like trauma and it's like manifested in the in the most serious way right yeah and when you say in the hospital it's like a, a psych ward at that yes. point right when you when you be, when you're suicidal and you get admitted yeah um okay, okay. yeah so but i think you know like i said is that it got a lot worse before it got better. And what I mean by that is that, you know, this was the, I feel like this was the time where I latched on to this, like um, this connection that wasn't ever in my life prior to that. So Mm -hmm. I wanted it. I wanted the attention. I wanted the people to care. I wanted the, um, that sense of, you know, togetherness kind of and now, you say that like that's a bad thing so what i mean by that is that these are all the way they manifested though in order to get that that happened in a negative sense because you know a lot of people you know so there's like this thing with um, a lot of like self-injurious behaviors is that those things can be facilitated by other people who are doing that so what I'm curious for yeah. those less vocabulary, what does right. that mean? So like, that's just like self-harm. So like, ah, you know, ah, whatever you. the method is like cutting, burning other mm. things, you know, it, so just things of oh, that sort. Injurious. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Mm. So, you know, um, basically it just kind of like, it threw me into this world where like, people seem to be more connected by like how severe their mental health issues were and the Uh, more sorry uh, i was gonna say the shared trauma of it yeah 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 the shared trauma we joke about that all the time it's like the best way to make friends is to find someone with shared trauma yeah you know something that people can empathize with relate to in your case you know, it, it almost got amplified in this environment where everyone has some of that. And then, you know, if I'm hearing you right, it almost, it's almost a competitive nature. Oh, okay. Who has it the worst? Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, you said it, dude, I mean, that's the reality and that's mm-hmm. dangerous because, yeah. you know, if you think about like, I'll be straight up and I'll tell you is that I was out of the people there yes, my life was like really messed up. And I was there because, you know, suicidal ideation and stuff. But I was one of the, you know, the milder people there, for sure. You know, I had a very difficult life. But some of these people who I met, you know, they have had very, very difficult lives. And those problems manifest more severely. Now, how how are these hospitals because that, that sounds systemic. It's like they're nurturing that type of environment, right? If everyone's in that same boat, everyone's experiencing that same type of competitive nature, why is it like that? You know, why, how did that happen, right? This, this area that's supposed to be focused on healing, mm. but instead, almost ironically, um, enhances or, or strengthens the core issue at hand the mental illness see i think this is a huge thing that you brought but this is like very important and i think you know a lot of people have probably thought about this but maybe you know not really vocalized it as much but you know the real i think the reality is that this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about social media and stuff that i think we grow up in this world that's like we get all these messages about like social comparison and popularity and like wanting to be wanting to fit in, not wanting to be the outcast, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when you're in this setting that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's like a hierarchy almost. And I don't think any of these things are intentionally, they're, they're, they're meant for healing, you know, they're trying to help you, but all of these 
young individuals, you know, I'm 17. There's people who are, this is a, all under 18 thing, right? So mm-hmm. all of you, we're, we're young, you know, we're growing and, you know, we have those tendencies to, to act out, to want to connect with other people, to, to want to prove ourselves to be likable, all these things, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think because of those, you know, internalized messages from our youth, from the world that we live in, mm-hmm. that, you know, everyone just needs to be better. Everyone needs to do more, you know, those things come out and, in this case they came out in like one of the most negative ways possible because you know everyone is dealing with a lot of trauma and Mm. at a time where everyone is extremely immature you know and the situations are very volatile um this can just cause like a lot of extra problems Mm and kind of this possibility that in places like this, you know, you're supposed to like get better. You know, this is a place to like help you heal. They give you resources, you know, they do group therapy, individual therapy, like occupational therapy, you know, it's like, it's very geared towards, you know, the healing to help people, the connectedness, to to process your thoughts, et cetera. But I think a lot of people just come out of the experience with this new ingrained like almost like not a complete understanding of like their own mental health Mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people can have this feeling like me um that i need to go back because Mm. the reality is that the real world is still filled with all those challenges all those problems and a lot of people have that like that feeling that like you know in a world that you know maybe no one ever understood them or they don't feel together or understood like they want that experience back that hospital was a safe place for them yeah i think it was like the first safe place for for many people i know for me it was um, you know there's there's a kind of a common i don't know if i want to call it a common trend but one thing that i've noticed is the power of unintentional things that um, nobody meant to do. Um, For instance, you you talk about growing up in a highly academic background, the clashing of cultures between your Western culture and then your Indian parents. And the, to quote you, you know, emotional abuse, but it's not like your parents were (laughs) had an agenda that day to say, okay, we're going to emotionally abuse our son, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's what I mean by the power of the unintentional. I think a lot of people, um, you know, when I talk about issues that say I, I, you know, went went through growing up and I get feedback or whatnot and people are like, oh, you shouldn't rag on this person so much. Um, You know, they didn't mean it. And And I'm not here blaming anyone. We, you and I are not here blaming say your parents or the system, all we're doing is is highlighting the fact that it did in fact happen. Because I think uh, a couple things, one, there's going to be a lot of people will try that will try to invalidate your experience, right? You didn't have it that bad. They didn't mean to do this to you. Um, You know, look at you versus this person, you could be so much worse off, right? Um, Unintentional. Right. And then the, the, the hospital system meant to heal people, meant to help them, then amplifying, again, the, the core issue in a way that was not intended as well. And so I, I kind of I bring that up to highlight the power of the unintentional. Right. And, and that just because someone did something to you, but they didn't mean it that way or or something happened to you that wasn't quote unquote meant to happen, you know, it's still very much a real situation. Your, your feelings to that situation are very much real, whether or not the intent behind the, the act happened. Because I think we can, you know, people who are also suffering, they might start to believe that as well. Like, oh, it, it you know, this person, they didn't mean it that way, right? Um, 
and just discrediting yourself and how you feel. So I, I know a little bit of tangent, but I, I noticed that kind of commonality between how a lot of people end up in these situations with, and a lot of times that abuse, both whether it's physical, emotional, mental. Um, I, I mean, we let's look at physical abuse. A lot of times something like, I don't want to quote a stat here, but I think when I was in college, there's something like 80% of cases where someone is physically abused, it's someone they, they know, right? Um, within their own, you know, for, I, they're even like friends, right? Um, or something of a close personal relationship. So um, long tangent, um, but again, just an interesting concept of these places meant to heal and then kind of a byproduct of it is, is maybe the opposite. Yeah. And, you know, um, this is actually, I mean, it's interesting that you brought this up. I don't think it was, you know, that much of a tangent because these are some of the feelings that I had right after getting out. I felt. How long were you I, there? I was there for two weeks, the first couple time. weeks. Okay. Yeah. First time. So, you know, the first time I was there, two weeks, got out. And, I, and you know, I had these messages. I internalized these messages. I actually invalidated my own experience. Mm-hmm. I, like, found myself comparing that, you know, all these people, you know, they had it way worse. You know, my life isn't that messed up. You know, things like that. And, you know, it took a lot of time for me to understand something, what you just said, and, like, take a little bit further is that, you know, in this process of like understanding my trauma, understanding my parents, figuring out my experiences. Yeah, we're not, we aren't blaming. We aren't blaming anyone, but it's okay to be angry. It's okay to have pain. It's okay to be pissed at your, you know, in this case, my parents, because that experience was real. Whether or not what they did was unintentional or like with the intent to hurt, which it wasn't, um they just didn't know any better with their communication or their own life story or you know how they decided to say certain things you know it's a reflection of their own traumas of their life so we're never I'm, i don't ever blame my parents but i'm upset with them and i'm angry with them and when you're with when you're in this kind of mentality it's a lot easier i think to to do a lot of that work later on communicate mm-hmm. with them tell them your needs because we're not blaming them when you blame someone you're in a very like defensive place when now when you say still angry still upset with them you know are you saying that as a you at 24 or back then when you were 17 both like, i guess still yeah. still hold on to some of that to this yeah. day yeah definitely no and i and i think i'll hold on for that forever you know because mm-hmm. You know, the, so the interesting thing, though, right, is that at 17, I did, I blamed them, though. Mm-hmm. So now at 24, I don't blame them. But I am still angry, and I'll be angry for the rest of my life because, yeah, it hurt. Mm-hmm. Those were my parents. And I love my parents to death. And, um, you know, they're awesome. And we've come a long way as a family. But, um, yeah, that experience was hard. And for me to, like for me to kind of be able to get to a place where I don't blame them anymore was, was like really great. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, uh, it's interesting too, cause you shared with me, you, you know, the, the picture that's, that's currently being painted is the, the woe is me East, right. Growing up, but, and, and you're the one that told me this, your parents were actually probably one of the most supportive people in regards to getting you, the quote unquote help that you need, right? Taking you to the hospital, believing in therapy, saying, Hey, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? How can we help? Um, I guess, um, so I, I want to put that frame in there for people listening that he had supportive parents, which is interesting because it plays the dynamic of your abusers are also your people helping you. Uh, but, um, you know, I, uh, I, I do want to, you know, maybe give your parents some credit because there are people, whether it's parents, uh, people in authority, whatever it might be, that don't have that intent to actually help you at the end of the day or support yeah. you. Now, okay, a couple weeks uh, you were in there, you got out, then what? Yeah, so um, pretty much after I got out, you know, there was 
like a period of like six months where I was kind of just out kind of going through therapy, you know, figuring things out back in school. But I think things were extremely volatile and up top, like mentally. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't just, I couldn't um, adapt back into the real world. It was like, there was a lot of problems. My mental health had declined severely. I had Mm -hmm. gone like a lot worse. I was um, just struggling. And um, eventually this like, in the moment um some events happened there was like a lot of impulsivity and i did overdose Mm. and you know this led me back then to the hospital i mean i was you know i overdosed i was like you know just transferred there i went to like first i was like icu then transferred back to the same hospital Mm. um in the psych ward and then i spent about a month there so there so then was like you know the then it was like the shift into the like okay yeah you know like it's no joke anymore because before i mean you know ideation and like um an attempt is like two very different things you know like they're they're game changers really so you know after that i think the way i kind of like approached mental health going forward had changed and i think that it had come to the point where i was kind of like ready to like fix try to fix my stuff i think before you know in from the time i was first hospitalized to the time i was my second hospitalization there was just a lot of like you know my 16 17 year old self just figuring stuff out wanting to go back like a lot of um immaturity and you know just you know there was like a lot of chaos and i think when when i did when i was hospitalized for the overdose then i kind of was like you know I don't think I want to like just not be here anymore so let me like Mm -hmm. try to figure stuff out and I think the biggest the biggest thing that propelled my where I am today is that you know after my hospitalization I was transferred to like a residential so Mm -hmm. you know it's different from a hospital um in a residential I was there for six weeks it's like a lockdown facility and um you know, I was basically just having like intensive psychotherapy, a lot of group work, individual therapy. Um, and it was there where my life changed. That's where, you know, this, where, that's what started the process of where I am today. And basically the story with that is that, um, you know, during my time, kind of you know, this also like started growing and formulating while I was at the hospital but really when I was at the residential I started having this like just this way with being able to like connect with people I could like talk to them I could like kind of make them feel heard I think that's a big thing um and you know a lot of these people are very you know again I'm like oh I'm on the milder side of like a lot of these you know these cases or like problems mm. or you know so there's a lot of people who are like have have had pretty traumatic experiences and like a very difficult life story and you know some of these people would get really agitated they wouldn't you know want to do certain things and i always had this like kind of way to just like calm them down to relax to make them feel understood comfortable and then they would calm down and like you know do the whatever activity or join the group or whatever right And I think when this therapist, who who was my therapist at the time there, when she saw that, um, I think one day in session, this was like, you know, maybe four weeks into the thing, she disclosed to me that when when she was younger, our roles were like reversed in the therapy room, that she was a patient and that there was another, there was a, then there was a psychologist who was conducting her therapy. And when she when she said that to me it kind of like was my light at the end of the tunnel you know it's like she kind of instilled some hope that you know if i can do it you can do it and you know it was like a really good feeling because something i had thought of um a lot during my upbringing was that when i look around i see my peers i see my friends i feel like everyone just has this like one skill or like this one thing that they're really really good at and that they you know sports or like more specific basketball 
drawing, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think I was very isolated in the sense where I just like, I, I just felt incompetent, you know? It's like, why don't I have this like one skill, which, which I feel passionate about, or I wish I love. And I know mm -hmm. that um, on the, it seems like that on the outside. I know everyone probably feels this to some degree, but I think what was so powerful in that room is that I instantly just like felt like I had that. Mm -hmm. I had that like talking to people and, you know, this just, just love for like conversations, you know, not just talking, like listening. That's a huge thing. And when I, when she told me that I was like, I became curious and I was like, Hey, you know, the rest of my time here, let me just see if I can like, develop this a bit more or just talk to more people and see if I, you know see if this connects with me or did she just randomly say this and when we had this conversation i feel like my path to pursuing you know a degree in this field of psych um really was like you know it was it was starting to formulate mm -hmm. and this kind of like pushed me to you know community college and eventually i transferred to a uc and then you know, after, after undergrad, here I am now, after taking some time off. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now, talk to me a little bit about your therapist, or I'll, I'll just quote you, because I thought it was something, um, well, I'll, I'll just call it powerful, it was powerful for you too. You know, we, I think everyone that goes to therapy kind of wishes that there's just this, this, <laughs> how, how do I want to say without spoiling, they, they just want there to be a concrete thing that says, Hey, if I do this, I will be fixed. I will be better. Uh, it will solve all my problems. And I think we know that that's not the case. In fact, there's a lot of people that will go through all the motions and at the end of the day, um, still struggle, right? But, and, I, and you'll have to correct me as to, you know, which therapist it was, or, you know, what age or whatever it might be. But one of your therapists had said, you know, at the end of the day, Ish, sometimes you need a little bit of magic. Am I quoting that right? Yeah, where, I think so. Where you can do everything you're supposed to. You can do what the therapist tells you to. You can go through the motions. You can change your lifestyle, put yourself in better environments. But sometimes to actually get better, you, you wake up one day or something happens in life that wasn't part of the plan. And things kind of just take a turn for the better. Um, you know, and I think the reason why I enjoyed that sentiment so much, uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's relatable to a lot of people because there's a lot of people that don't believe in things like, oh, well, obviously even, well, magic or religion uh, or therapy. But I think everyone is aware of coincidence things that just happen to them. Um, and I think everyone's had experiences with coincidences and, you know, it, it stands to reason, okay, well, in my life, there's many a coincidence that happens. Why can't it also be for, say, some of my mental health issues, right? Why can't something magically happen that might just turn things around? And so, I, you know, I don't like using the word hope, hope uh, as much, but it certainly does... Uh, give people hope because uh, I don't think that hope is really much based on science, right? I think that's the therapy is the science of it all. And then hope is saying, okay, I, I think that one day maybe something nice might happen to me, mm -hmm. uh, which I think should be helpful for a lot of people that don't say have religious background, right? Cause they can't, they don't believe in the idea of, Oh, I'll just put things in God. Right. But they can believe in coincidences. They can believe in hope. That's a separate matter. Mm. Um, I guess what was, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
was that moment that when your therapist told you that she had also been in the system, was that your magic bullet, if I'm remembering right? Or was there a different moment where it was like an aha and things kind of turned around? No, yeah, that was the, that was a spark. That, that was, was a, a turning spark. point. You know, I think that was, you know, so, you know, as we learned later, you know, point four in school, self-disclosure can be a very, very powerful tool when used appropriately. So what that is, is basically, you know, sharing your own, you know, maybe life, personal things in order to really connect with your client or something like that. Right. And in that moment, I feel like, like, I, that's what I needed. I, I sometimes I think to myself, like, where would I be if like that didn't happen? You know? And yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, the reality is that a lot of people who suffer from clinical mental health issues, um, a lot of people just like can get better and can manage their depression and get to a more stable place, but to really come like full circle and to, you know, be able to thrive, that mm -hmm. takes, that's like a miracle. You know, I, I, I truly, you know, that's the magic. Like I, I don't think that, um, it really happens that often because some of these people are like so far gone, you know, like depression has them like an endless spectrum on the right side of just like the severity becoming just like, you have no will to live. No, like, there's no meaning at life is meaningless, yeah. you know? So from someone who's like that to really be able to like find that will that drive and flourish is, is like pretty, it's just like, it's pretty amazing i would say yeah so i think like you know from there um and even when i got out you know there were still a lot of ups and downs there were a lot of downs still and there's still downs now but i think you know the biggest thing is uh i think what i've learned is that like through therapy what you want is if there's like one thing that you can have in session one right you see a therapist you just go, is that the goal at the end of the session, I think, is just to instill a little bit of some powerful curiosity. That's all you need. Because if you can like help someone be a little bit curious as to like, why are things this way? Why does this happen like this way? You know, when, when my girlfriend does this and I react this way, it's like, why? Why do I do that? You know? there's a lot of power in that because you open up this world of like introspection and kind of analysis where you can kind of, you know, take some time to like process these things, you know, and depending on, you know, the type of therapy that's happening, you know, I know you mentioned that you're seeing like a CBT therapist. I've seen that and, or I'm actually seeing that person now, but there's like a lot of different types, but you know, CBT is a very um, application hands-on type therapy where there's a lot of like processing of your like cognitions and thoughts and then, you know, and into your actions, you know, like, why do I do this? You can like think about these and, you know, different types of um, interventions like, you know, like thought records or something like that, where you're just like writing these things down and you're like, you know, this is the feeling or like, you know, I have this thought, then this is the feeling and then this is the action and like, you know, just figuring it all out. So I think that um, therapy has been, you know, I've been in therapy for 10 years now. It's been very effective for me. And I think there's always new things to learn and a lot of more like depths that you never really thought were there, I guess. Hmm. Thank you. I, you know, one thing that I think is helpful. If if you think of what a magic bullet is as far as getting better, I think it comes down to, you know, finding a passion, right? Be willing to say, you know, find something to live for. Mm -hmm. Um, that was kind of your magic bullet when this person said, Hey, I'm I was you, mm -hmm. right? However many years ago. And then you thought to yourself, Oh, I can do what she's doing. 
right? I can then be on the flip side and help other people. And you learned that too in the residency when you just help had people open up to you, right? About their situations. Uh, in my case, you know, my passion ended up being what I'm doing now, uh, you know, sharing other people's experiences with um, other people that are going through a tough time uh, and probably will always be going through a tough time. Um, you know, I, on the last episode with my friend, Matt, we talked about, you know, life will continue to beat us down for, forever. You know, the, the goal at the end of the day is for a majority of things to be good, but it doesn't matter, you know, if you're 15, 25, 35, 55, 75, there's going to be some hard days, right? Uh, and then ideally it's a matter of just managing um, you know, how, how those impact us. And one thing I want to highlight or kind of take notice of, uh, a common thing when it comes to, um, depression and this is a, I want to mention this a long time ago, early in the podcast, but when you became suicidal and didn't care or felt alone in the world, um, and kind of numb to it. That's a that feeling right there, or, or the lack of feeling, is kind of a common denominator when it comes to you know suicidal tendencies, if you will. On episode eleven with my friend Katie, we talked about her story uh, with battling suicide and um, and depression. And it came down to the day that she decided to, you know, uh, go through with things. Uh, it was because she had a moment where she just became numb to the world, right? Didn't have things to look forward to, or, or maybe in that moment didn't have anything to care for. But afterwards, and then why we're able to continue is because we found things that we're passionate for, Right. So the reason why I bring that up, uh, you know, if anyone else kind of going through a similar situation, whether it's, you know, suicide, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, being in the system, you have to try new things, right? A lot of people are like, well, I don't know what I'm passionate about. Well, you got to try things to find out what you're passionate about, right? <laughs> and at the end of the day, the cool thing about it is um, you'll try a bunch of things and you might find out what you don't like. And that's, that's an, <laughs> that itself is learning, right? You can say, Oh, I, I did this and I wasn't a huge fan. Um, but it kept you busy, right? Trying new things keeps you busy, keeps you out of the thought loops. Um, so I, I want to, to touch on that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the, the experiences that I want to touch on this very briefly to kind of end things out. Obviously, you are dating one of my very good friends in Emily. The experiences that you've had growing up, you know, going through the system, learning about it, growing from it, having a magic moment, if you will, turn things around and actively trying now to make the world a better place. How does that impact not only the relationships, you know, that you have surrounding you, whether it's parents, friends, but also, you know, in, in more your relationship with Emily too. Yeah, I mean, I think like when you when you go through like this journey of, you know, therapy and mental health and trying to figure things out, um you just develop like a better sense of self over time. And when you're more congruent with the way that you feel and you like understand um your own process or your own behaviors a little bit more, not fully. Um, you can understand and be more empathetic towards like others as well. Like if they act a certain way, if they do a certain thing, you know, you might be able to be like, you know, why are they doing this? And I think that when you have a more understanding of the why, it becomes a lot easier to communicate effectively. And I think that, you know, the biggest thing going forward, not just with Emily, but just with any, you know, relationship, friends, whatever, parents, is that, you know, communication is, is essential to being like good communication is essential to having a, 
um, a functioning relationship with whoever. And I think um, the biggest, I personally believe, you know, like, I mean, human beings are social beings. Like we want to be connected with other people. We want to not feel lonely. You know, we want to have that, those friends, those, that community, you know, that love piece. And when, when we're with like our significant others, if we aren't able to really have like a lot of good communication and a lot of like problems like that, then that becomes the catalyst for all these other problems to like manifest and get worse. So I think when you're, when you have um, relationships with people, I think the biggest thing is like doing your own research and like figuring out things to work on your communication. And I think with Emily, the process for myself, like going through therapy has helped me like process a lot of like my own communication issues to her a lot of like her things and you know if there's ever any type of like problems we just try to understand and be empathetic towards each other and just communicate our individual needs so that we can kind of um just coexist more peacefully yeah Hmm. perfect well if we want to you know if i want to kind of give people an overall I don't want to say summary but if you want to take away anything from this you know it's funny because each is probably one of the few people we could talk about the science behind things and, and what it's like being put you know quote unquote again into the system and and how it plays out in, into helping people but the the thing that I want to take away from this isn't the science it is again you know find that magic moment right or, or at least hope that that there will one day be a magic moment of coincidence that gets you through or gets you to that that turning point right um any any last thoughts ish that we didn't get a chance to to touch on you know i guess i will just say one last thing because i think it's really important and you know, um, I think in this whole process of like therapy or mental health or understanding, you know, there's this like short little quote that like um, one of my therapists kind of like mentioned to me, but you know, it was just when it was said in this way, I think it was more powerful um, is that, you know, in order to avoid pain, we create suffering. And I think that you know, in dealing with mental health or your own emotions or problems or your life, you know, there can be a lot of, um, like, suffering that you're going through, which is kind of been like camouflage and which is like hidden. And, you know, when we think about these things, then these issues, my, my issues with my parents, my dysfunctional relationship, whatever. These, these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they're they can be painful Mm -hmm. and a lot of times we don't want to feel that pain we want to avoid the pain Mm -hmm. but i think you know when we can um like when we can confront it instead of avoiding it we can slowly like reduce our suffering and there's a lot of power in that so i would just like you know I, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge advocate for therapy, and I, I'm a firm believer that everyone on the planet should have a therapist or should, should see a therapist. But if, if there's, like, one takeaway, it's just that, you know, I would urge people to try and be, like, just a little bit more curious. Why is this this way? Why did I do this? Why did I say this to this person? And when you're a little bit more curious, like, in your own form, you know, whatever you like, you're, you know, just you can have more access to information you can journal you can do whatever and you can process these things and that process can like lead to a lot of healing and just a better quality of life Hmm. so yeah thank you and thank you everyone else who tuned in today to listen or to watch i think uh, we all have our own issues that we deal with Sorry, I, I use that joke with Emily, so I have to use it here now that you're with us. Um, so if you or anyone you know 
kind of going through the same feelings that that Yish and I have or have had a similar experience to Yish, although his is rather unique, but still relevant and relatable to a lot of people in maybe varying degrees, you know, share this with them, right? Again, they are not alone. You you know, we're all going through a little bit of something in life and that will continue for as long as we're around and hopefully you're around for a long, long time. Um, and, and by no means should people feel like they're the only ones suffering through that. And again, you know, find your magic moment. Um, and if you guys feel like you need a friend, you can come meet mine. We'll see you all next week. Thanks, Ish.